How can you pilot a spacecraft if you can't find your way around your own apartment? This is a video essay about the Gus Van Sant nine minute short, The Discipline of DE, a film that probably only a few of you have seen, but, and this is a very weighty opinion of mine, I think it is possible that the world might be a better place if we all watched this film once a year, listened to it carefully, and took its lessons to heart. And that's why I want to talk about it today. Now, I first saw The Discipline of DE on the Cinema 16 American Shorts DVD, which came out in May 2006. I watched the film while traveling on a train, and as soon as it finished, I watched it again. Let me be clear, though. The discipline of DE was not a window opening into a new world for me. It was better than that. It was one of those eerie experiences where you see something which you've already spent a great deal of time thinking about and, in my case, doing. It's an experience that feels like someone has taken your thoughts and set pictures and sounds to them. You may remember me going through a similar sensation when I first saw Bergman's The Passion of Anna. The Discipline of DE was made in either 1978 or 1979. No one seems to know exactly, and this includes Gus Van Sant himself. IMDb even has the film's release year being 1982 crazy. What we do know is that it was adapted from a short story by William Burroughs that appeared in his Exterminator collection, published in 1973. Gus Van Sant was a student at the time that he was getting ready to make the film, and he acquired permission from Burroughs to use the story by opening the New York City phone book, finding Burroughs' phone number, and arranging to see him. This was the first time the two met, and Burroughs would go on to appear in two later films by Van Sant, Drugstore Cowboy and Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. Gus Van Sant's way of approaching Burroughs to acquire permission to use the story for the discipline of DE is also a very DE way of working. Oh, what's that? What is DE? Now forgetful of me. So the film starts off as a film about Colonel Sutton Smith before quickly becoming a meditation perhaps on the nature of doing things. And it all starts with an epiphany experienced by the Colonel, which then transfers into a lesson from the Colonel, moves into the experiences of a student learning DE and finishes with a case study. The revelation or epiphany that Colonel Sutton has happens when he's looking at the remnants of his breakfast. He looks at the objects on the breakfast table, calculating the moves to clear it. He measures the distance of his chair to the table, how to push chair back and stand up without hitting the table with his legs. He has discovered the simple and basic discipline of DE, do easy. DE is a way of doing. DE simply means doing whatever you do in the easiest, most relaxed way you can manage, which is also the quickest and most efficient way. DE is a way of doing, a way of doing what you have to do with the least amount of fuss or effort and the highest rate of success. It's not about doing something on a surface level or doing something just for the sake of getting it done. It's about doing something as well as you can in the most chill way you can do it. And in 2006, or whenever I actually saw the discipline of DE for the first time, I was already locked into the arms of my own relationship with DE but without ascribing that name to it. If you know me, then you'll know that I have developed a system for doing whatever task people are asked to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I have a way of making coffee, of cleaning, of opening a door with a key, of passing an object from one hand to the other, of peeling a tangerine, of placing a towel on a rail, of lighting a match, of spreading butter on toast. Without really thinking about it, I've developed what is for me the easiest but most effective way of doing whatever it is I have to do. And this is a living process, a work in progress. Nothing is set in stone, improvements are always welcome and constantly being searched for. And it's not just me who's like this, there are others. And one other that I'd like to talk about is Gus Van Sant. And, as ever, I'd like to remind people that I'm speaking in broad strokes. Now, when you make a film, you have a number of people helping you, but that's not how Gus Van Sant's experience of the discipline of DE went. He fulfilled every technical role. He was the camera operator, the cinematographer, the grip, the sound recordist, the editor, the everything. There was no one else. And you can see how he's made these roles a little easier for himself in the film. First of all, there's no music, so no need for composition. Secondly, the majority of the camera work is locked off on a tripod. Nice and easy and controlled. You can see cheeky shots he's grabbed in different locations too. Take a look at this shot of a dustpan. Look at those tiles on the floor. This is not the student's house, this is somewhere else. Who's ever going to notice these differences? No one. That's who. There are also a few moments featuring reverse footage and although I don't know this for a fact, I would imagine that Gus Van Sant is achieving this by turning the camera upside down. That's how people used to reverse footage in the old days. You turn the camera upside down and after the film has developed you take these shots, turn them the right way up and the process of doing this reverses those sections of film. Bingo bango, reverse footage. 
Lean, simple, effective. You can also see this DE approach continue into his future films like, for example, My Own Private Idaho. First of all, My Own Private Idaho is a film that Gus Van Sant decided to make by making another film first. He knew he'd need a bigger budget than he'd ever had before to do My Own Private Idaho the way he wanted to do it with the cast he wanted. And so he made a whole other film, Drugstore Cowboy, in order to get that money. Fans of cinema have probably seen this approach taken before. One example that leaps to mind is Polanski, how he made Repulsion in order to get the budget he wanted for his dream film, Cul-de-sac. I know. I bet you weren't expecting to hear that his dream project was cul-de-sac. My Own Prav Idaho also has elements of DE in the filmmaking. Most pointedly for me is the moment with the talking magazine covers. Now let me ask you a quick question. How would you film something like this? And in particular, how would you film something like this in a world that doesn't have any CGI? Gus Van Sant's solution is elegance personified. He simply had the actor standing behind sheets of glass with the magazine text printed on it. That's it. It's that simple. That's DE. How quickly can you do something and do it well? Take your time, kid. How fast can you take your time, kid? What I also want to talk about here is not only how Gus Van Sant progressed as a filmmaker, but also his place within the interconnected web of film history and filmmakers. You see, if you make a film, release a film, then it's on the shelf next to films made by other people, and there are connections between these people who made these films. They're facing the same challenges, thinking about similar things, and reacting to the choices that each other makes. For example, there's a brief scene of walking in the discipline of DE, and I want to look at two examples of how Gus Van Sant would go on to continue filming people walking. Walking is good stuff. It's meditative, repetitive, it gets you up and moving, and it's been a staple of cinema ever since the first reel passed through the first camera. But where walking and cameras really became something special is when people learned how to move a camera with someone walking. What's more, there's really two kinds of walking in a film. There's walking that serves as a function to get characters to a place where something happens, and then there are films that revel in walking, where walking is the point. And this is where Jerry and Elephant come in. Jerry is a little scene, Gus Van film starring Matt Damon and Casey Affleck as two men called Jerry who use the word Jerry a lot when they talk. Jerry and Jerry go for a walk in the desert and get Jerry lost and that's the film. What you may be unaware of is that Jerry is Gus Van Sant paying homage to Hungarian filmmaker Belatar. Jerry is Gus Van Sant making a Belatar film. How do you pay homage to Belatar? You film tracking shots of people walking and you make walking the point of the film. Elephant is another example of this where walking is the point but instead of Belatar, Gus Van Sant is now talking about Alan Clark. Non-British film fans may be unaware of Alan Clark. For a while it was difficult to go through a day in this country without hearing his name. You don't hear it so much anymore. Alan Clark worked largely in TV, made very pared down films, often technically referred to as TV plays rather than films, about socio-political topics. Elephant, Scum, Made in Britain, The Firm. These films, or plays, really formed the cornerstone of what this country was about for a while. When remaking or reimagining Elephant, Gus Van Sant changed the topic from the troubles of Northern Ireland to something a bit more recognisable to North American audiences, school shootings. But what he has retained is how the original Elephant was made. Clark had seen and loved Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and in particular, he really loved the use of Garrett Brown's Steadicam. And after being introduced to a Steadicam by Stephen Frears, another filmmaker that no one really talks about anymore, Clark made the Steadicam a regular in his filmmaking toolkit. When Gus Van Sant wanted to reimagine Elephant and pay homage to Clark, he also picked up that Steadicam. Now I'm not suggesting that Gus Van Sant can't do his own thing, because I very much believe that both Jerry and Elephant are 100% Gus Van Sant films. What I am saying is that when you make a film, you're having a conversation with film history. You're looking at and talking about things which have come before. And Gus Van Sant isn't just paying homage to people, he's also going deeper and in ways you might not easily spot. Elephant, for example, has an extremely complicated layered audio track featuring birdsong, babbling brooks, all the things that the children in the film would never go on to experience after their lives are cut short, but sounds which we think of as being eternal within the lifespan of the planet. That kind of detail is nowhere to be found in Clark's Elephant. 
The soundtrack in Gus Van Sant's Elephant is the work of Hildegard Westerkamp. And that's how you make great films. You go through the history of film, respond to it in your own unique way. You work with great people and you give them the space to do great things. And where did all of this begin? With a nine minute short film called The Discipline of DE, a film where the director had no one to work with and had to do everything himself, but he did everything to the best of his abilities. After that, he went off and made a 45 minute feature film called Alice in Hollywood, which was never released and has never been seen. The film was a total failure. Never let a poorly executed sequence pass. There is always a reason for missing an easy toss. Repeat toss and you will find it. Surely this is the easy way. If you wrap your knuckles against a window jam or door, brush your leg against a desk or catch your feet in the curled up corner of a rug or strike a toe against a chair, go back and repeat sequence. You may experience a strange feeling as if the objects are alive and hostile, trying to twist out of your fingers, jump out at you and stub your toe or trip you. You will be surprised how far off course you were to hit that chair, that window jam or door. Get back on course and do it again. Instead of giving up after the misstep of Alice in Hollywood, Gus Van Sant got back on track, just like the student in the discipline of DE. And he made Malinache, which, true, only a handful of people have seen. But then he made another film, and then another. Chip, 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 drip, drip, drip. The constant dripping of mineral-rich water from the cave ceiling will, over time, form solid shapes that last for centuries. Sometimes we don't want to get up and deal with things. And this isn't just about Gus Van Sant. This is about all of us. This is about me, and it's about you. Sometimes we'd like to just stay sitting where we are. But getting up, doing things, is the first step to greatness. Whenever I have something to do and I'd rather not do it, no matter how big or small my something is, I remind myself of this moment from the discipline of DE. The miracle of the washstand glass. We all know the glass there on a rusty razor blade streaked with pink toothpaste, Quick the fingers go to work and the glass sparkles like the holy grail in morning sunlight. Try taking that attitude with you as you continue through this crazy life. Don't fumble, jerk, grab an object. Don't fear or feel weary at the thought of anything you have to do. Quick the fingers go to work. Now if you want to go and watch The Discipline of DE, please feel free. But what I'm really trying to say here is not go see this one film, it's more that one person's dedication can go on to become something bigger than the sum of that one person. And that whatever it is that we do, it ends up being connected to other things and people in ways that are far reaching. I guess what I'd really like you to think about is other films which taught you a lesson in life. Or rather, films which you saw which had a lesson that you'd already considered. It's a great experience. It really makes you feel connected to something much larger than yourself. And if you haven't seen a film that had this impact on you yet, just keep looking. It is out there, and when you find it, it's gonna feel mighty good. Find it quickly, but take your time. Take your time, kid. How fast can you take your time, kid? <laughs>